Space allocation planning is a complex problem involving the allocation of limited resources to meet business goals, reduce operating costs, and promote an effective and productive workplace. One of the difficulties with talking about space planning in the context of a large organization like NASA Langley Research Center is how to get the big picture without losing the necessary details. If we look at an aerial photo or map, only a small part of the area that we see is actually buildings. We also see roads, parking lots, grass. If we zoom into a small area, we could bring in floor plan details, which would be too dense at the full extent of the map. We can see room level details here, but even for this small area, it's difficult to see the necessary detail. Also, many of these buildings have multiple floors that we can't see. Let's zoom in on one particular building. The first thing we see is that there are two floors to this building. We also see that there are a lot of areas in the floor plan that we don't care about in the allocation problem. Circulation areas, stairwells, bathrooms, mechanical equipment rooms. So let's just highlight the spaces that are of interest to us. What we would like to do is focus on these areas and condense this into a diagram where we preserve the relative areas. We could use a shadow line to separate the floors providing a single diagram for the entire building. We could repeat that process for the other buildings as well. We would like to use the same process to eliminate the unused space in the map and create one unified diagram for the set of buildings. If we were to apply this process to the entire center, we would have this diagram. Even for the entire center, we can clearly see rooms as small as single offices. It's also important to note that neighborhoods of buildings are preserved in the diagram, as well as general location. So what can we do with this diagram? We can begin to symbolize it by showing just those spaces that are appropriate for general office use. We would like to show technical areas, but we would like to do so in a way that indicates the owning organization. So if we have some organizational hierarchy, we would like to associate colors with each organization such that the perceived closeness in color is indicative of the closeness of the organizations in the hierarchy. Applying this to the 150 plus organizations at NASA Langley, we can begin to get a feel for ownership in these spaces. We could use the same scheme to color point features, indicating all the personnel at the center. Here we can see where we have people located near their labs, we can see where we have fragmentation of organizations, and where we might have opportunities for better using the space. One further note on this is that we can use any filter to focus on a particular subset of the spaces, and we can substitute other metrics for area. This could, for instance, give us a diagram where the relative size is indicative of maintenance costs. In any complex planning task, it is useful to have a model that we can evaluate to estimate if we are meeting our goals. That model must be inclusive enough to encompass the important variables and effects, but simple enough to make analysis possible. In particular, we need to capture not just the obvious infrastructure related costs, but we need to develop a cost model that captures the effects on performance. In many fields involving design, engineering, or research, the process is significantly about communication. Here I'm referring to communication in a collaborative sense. No one person can possess the breadth and depth of knowledge necessary. There are technologies that address this, including to a lesser extent telephone and email, and to a greater extent web forums, chat protocols, and specific collaborative technical applications. For this type of communication, though, the most effective is still face-to-face, -face, and co-location is critical to achieving a synergistic effect. Lastly, compression and synergy are not mutually exclusive. Rather, they are generally self-reinforcing, but in the limit as our infrastructure nears the minimum, it becomes difficult to achieve and maintain both. In order to make the model as flexible as possible, it needs to be as general as possible. The first generalization is to refer to any person or function that consumes space to be a consumer. This could be a laboratory, a conference area, etc. Similarly, both technical and office areas are simply referred to as space. Resources are what bind the two together. Consumers have requirements for them and the spaces can provide them. The most common resource is of course area, but additional resources can be modeled like communication jacks, bandwidth, power, etc. Once we have our basic components, we need to be able to evaluate and compare particular allocation plans. We need to be able to ask, does this allocation meet our rules? And in comparing two valid allocations, which one is objectively better? For the purpose of this discussion, a very simple example will be used. Here we have a single building with four office areas in orange and a small lab in yellow. There are four employees and one manager, all assumed to be in the same organization. 
The first constraint we will discuss is that all of the minimum consumer requirements must be satisfied. For instance, there may not be enough room for both of the employees in this office. We also have space compatibility considerations. So we may say that a person's office should not generally be placed in a lab. We also have compatibility considerations between consumers. This manager must have a single office, so he may be said to be incompatible with anyone else. We could also define compatibility based on contractors versus civil servants or based on organization. If we have two allocations that meet the constraints, we use our metrics to determine which is superior. All of our metrics have been driven to a cost basis, with most reflecting an annual efficiency related cost. The first metric is simply a move cost. For each consumer we physically move, there is an associated cost. We also have a metric that captures the inefficiency of allocating too much or too little office space to each person. The synergy metric is designed to capture the inefficiency of having collaborating individuals distributed over some distance. Each pair of consumers has an interaction frequency which is assumed to be uniform across the entire group. To determine the associated cost, we need to consider all the interactions across various distances along with the average speed and salary data. To take this one step further, we can consider that we have individuals who are members of two separate working groups but who also share a common parent organization. Interactions with this higher level may occur much less frequently. We can model any such composite relationship simultaneously along with other special cases, such as an individual who acts as a liaison with another group. The last metric here is a cousin of the synergy metric, but its purpose is to capture interactions related to stationary functions such as labs. Once we have this general model, how do we populate it with real data? One problem is that we are pulling data from many different data sources, including personnel, GIS, and space utilization databases, and these are all constantly changing. The process we use is to snapshot the data, resolve any consistency issues, and as needed, reconcile any resulting plan with the current snapshot. Resolving and mapping the source data to our general model is very time intensive and involves both data and scenario specific considerations. An XML schema was developed to provide a language for the model. This language is tightly bound to the source code implementation and is reflective of the very general nature of the model. Since virtually every data source has some sort of mapping to an XML schema, we can leverage data transformation languages like XQuery to do the heavy lifting based on a recipe that codifies the corporate knowledge.